Well, every blessing to you all. Welcome back to my open air pulpit. It's a beautiful November morning, a very early November morning, and it's beautiful. It's around one degrees of Celsius with the wind chill around zero degrees of Celsius. But in a sort of paradoxical sort of a way, it's rather mild. I guess the winter sun is warming me up. Please go to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. And as I've been saying over the past few videos, I'm currently working through the Old Testament, getting a great blessing. And again, please join me this coming Sunday when I continue to work through the book of Exodus, like chapter 32. But a few nights ago, I was reading through 2 Samuel. Saul is dead. And in my Schofield reference Bible, he seems to suggest that when Saul got into the incident with the Philistines and was seriously wounded, that somehow he wasn't dead. And yet Samuel, who wrote First and Second Samuel, says like three times how Saul was dead. And of course, you go to Second Samuel, chapter 1, chapter 2, a Gentile makes himself known to King David, says to David that he found Saul, in his mind, the enemy of David, which of course he was. But uh, from David's point of view, Saul was a prince in Israel. He was also David's father-in-law. Like I said last time, it was a family affair, you see. And this Gentile says to David, well, I found Saul, he was dying and I basically finished him off. Here I am, I've come to collect my reward. And he says, how dare you? You touched the Lord's anointed. You put your hands on a prince of Israel and you killed him. Of course, the guy was lying. But the point is this, Schofield thinks that he hadn't died, was dying. And he saw this Gentile, an Amalek from memory, calls over to him and says, uh, please, finish me off before these Philistines get their hands on me. That shows the dangers, of course, of lying. So as I went through the Old Testament, checking different reference Bibles, I think it's always helpful to have reference Bibles to see what greats have put down over the years. Somebody once said all of your best expositors are probably from the last century. I would say probably from the 19th century. Uh, not the 20th century, but the 19th century. People like Larkin, very good. Schofield, very good. A lot of your preachers today, if they are pre-millennial, pre-tribulational, chances are they have got what they have, or what they preach, they've probably got from people like Larkin and Schofield. Tremendous Bible expositors. Larkin was tremendous. Schofield, very good. Like I said, I found a few footnotes of his where he is wrong he says in Luke chapter 6 when Jesus Christ prayed for his apostles that that was in reference to personal election that's Calvinism of course nothing to do with personal election the Lord chose his apostles Luke chapter 6 for service not salvation but two footnotes out of what two or three hundred that I don't agree with isn't too bad I suppose so, if you can, read the Bible for yourself. King James, obviously. Cambridge print is the best option. No, this isn't Cambridge. This isn't Oxford. This is uh, Zondervan, if you care to know. I bought this back in 2005, uh, long before I was aware of the textual criticism or the textual issues concerning different versions of the King James Bible. So, you may have occasional readings from yours truly from the pulpit which don't match the Oxford or Cambridge editions but probably 95% of this particular uh, text is accurate but like I said it's not Cambridge not Oxford I only use it because it's my pulpit Bible a lot of footnotes that I made uh, going back many many years and I got footnotes in here which I haven't even preached on in fact, I wrote this footnote on the 20th of February, 2007. You probably can't read that. But anyhow, for this morning, I want to look at King David, if I may. Israel's finest king. 
Religious Jews look up to David, they look up to Moses, they look up to Joshua, and so do, so do Bible-believing Christians like myself. But of course we know that they weren't perfect. If you speak to Muslims, they say all of Allah's prophets were sinless. And they have some Old Testament ones which they have pinched <coughs> and put into their Quran. They say that Muhammad was sinless and Jesus Christ was sinless. Well, of course, Jesus is the only man who was sinless. But someone like David, a man after the Lord's own heart, was far from perfect. So we don't follow these men when it comes to trying to get to heaven. And one of the reasons why the Bible was written was to, first and foremost, give us God's word so we would know what he thought about this or that, help us through difficult, dark and depressing days, but also so we could see what people like David would do when they found themselves in a sticky situation. 2 Samuel chapter 11, 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I could... I suppose call this video the letter there have been many famous and infamous letters over the years and I will discuss those as we work through chapter 11 look at verse 1 if you will and it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Should have been with his men, if you go back to the Old Testament or church history. For the Old Testament, kings were not only priests and prophets, but they were also commanders. David was Israel's commander-in-chief. And it's a pitiful story to read about King David at this time in his life, around 45 or 50, at his prime, I suppose, staying back. And uh, we would say that by his choice to stay back, to put his feet up, to relax, to take it easy, he has betrayed his men, basically. If you look at the popery or the papacy throughout church history, right up until probably the 19th century, all of their popes would go out with their priests and uh, mercenaries to fight. And they would conquer lands, confiscate lands, conquer the people and that's what the word uh, Nicolation means conquer the laity over the laity and the Lord Jesus Christ would condemn the Nicolations but the popes would march with their men of war kill people left right and center that's one of the reasons why the Vatican is so wealthy and other church of Rome is the wealthiest in the world and that's one of the reasons why Premiers and uh, princes and uh, presidents go up to Rome because they want to get a cut of the money, basically. They want access to Rome's millions. The same would be true of the royal family. If you go back to probably Henry V, Henry VI, right up until probably George III or thereabouts, kings of England would jump on horses, crisscross the UK with the sword, of course, remove people's heads and uh, confiscate the land if you think of someone like uh, the guy in uh, Scotland uh, Braveheart there was a movie made some years ago by Mel Gibson and uh, that was based on a true story and of course the character that Mel Gibson uh, was playing was a Catholic bandit he was a terrorist going around Scotland and England killing people left right and centre wanted to have freedom, or so he said, and yet he was in submission to the popery, the papacy. I keep saying popery, <laughs> but it's the same thing. In submission to the papacy, would bow down to the Pope, would take his orders from the Pope. That's what Northern Ireland has been worrying about for the past probably four or five hundred years. Keep the Pope away, keep Ireland split, Northern Ireland, Protestant, uh, being uh, nationalists, Southern Ireland being Catholic, being Republicans. A lot of history. If you know history, you know what I'm saying is so. But the Catholic bandit in Scotland, at least he would go out, fight his battles himself, unlike people like uh, Yasser Arafat. For many years he was 
Mbappe comfortably living in his bunker in uh, Palestine, no such place of course, and he was sending out Alessans to kill Jews, kill enemies of Allah, and yet Yasser Arafat had a Gentile wife, a French wife, a French Catholic Gentile wife, non-Islamic, and he had a couple of sons with his wife, and of course his sons lived in America. They went out doing their jihad, but again, came to pass, always a good term, it came to pass, it came to pass. But of course, nothing comes to pass in hell, every day is the same. And it came to pass after the year was expired. There's a word that we use all the time, expired. Check the sell-by dates on your foods. Don't eat it if it's past the expiry date. At the time when kings go forth to battle, David should have been with his men, leading from the front, at least Cromwell would lead from the front, but many of today's generals, going back over the last hundred years or so, don't lead from the front, they lead from the back. They delegate, they give orders to their men, and that's one of the reasons why many battles have been lost. When kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab. Now Joab is David's chief of staff, if you will, but David is Israel's commander-in-chief. Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, this is a major battle, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, or Rabbah. But David, but David, negative connotation, but David tarried, stayed still at Jerusalem. So he doesn't go with his men, he stays back. That was the first mistake that King David would make. Yes, he was a man after the Lord's own heart, greatly beloved in Israel, no king, pre or post him, comes anywhere near him, like Solomon, Solomon's wisdom was remarkable, and when Solomon died, uh, nobody was able to replace him, but he's staying back at Jerusalem, contrast that to popes, who would rarely stay back at Rome, they would jump on their horses, like I say, along with their counterparts in England and off they would go and they would put people down I mean they would massacre people but today's historians don't like to look at it in such a negative way they like to gloss over it and that's why you've got to do your own research don't allow your average historian to try and explain these things to you if you love the truth and of course the truth will set you free but if you really love the truth do your own research and you will discover very quickly how the papacy made its wealth and how the royals, the Windsors, made their wealth as well. Look at verse 2. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Middle East homes have a flat roof, unlike Western homes, which are pointed <laughs> your middle eastern home is a flat roof and i've been to israel and it's still very much the case today in fact most of the middle east have flat roofs and david can't sleep got too much time in his hands i suppose we could suggest around this time in david's ministry that he's backsliding they would all backslide there are times when joshua wanted to just kill himself couldn't go on any longer moses would also want to kill himself, couldn't go on any longer. And this past Sunday, I was looking at Exodus chapter 32, and uh, we were looking at Aaron getting involved with the golden calf incident, a really sorry state. And uh, I've said this over the years, that if you were to press me as to whether or not Aaron was saved, I would say probably so, but I can't prove it. I cannot prove it. But Aaron got into that sticky situation, make us a god, make us gods, make us a calf, give us something to worship, Moses has gone south, he has disappeared, we what not, what has become of him, we don't know what has become of him, and old Aaron buckles very easily, every man in his best state is altogether vanity, and he gets this idol, creates it, and he says, these are your gods, O Israel, and that's one of the reasons why, if you are saved, you shouldn't have pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ, shouldn't have idols, any depiction of the Lord Jesus Christ, because God hates it. Came to pass in an evening tide, late at night, 
that David arose from off his bed, he cannot sleep, and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. We could say this, that what David is now doing is paramount to being a peeping Tom, basically. He can't sleep. He probably feels convicted that he's not with his men on the front line. He gets up and he sees this woman woman taking a bath. I don't think she was deliberately trying to get his attention. I doubt she even thought for one moment that the king of Israel would see her and on top of that would take a shine to her. Came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, the king's palace. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. David's got several wives around this time. Abigail is referred to as the wife of Nabal. And every time Abigail is found in first and second Samuel, you've got that tag at the end, the wife, the wife of Nabal, like Bathsheba, will be called the wife of Uriah. That's the Holy Ghost's way of saying that God didn't approve of David's behavior, David's uh, decision to do what he is about to do. And of course, we all know about David and Bathsheba, but there's much more to the story. It's not just that the king sees this woman and summons her to the palace. That's the basic part, uh, part of the story. There's much more to it, and that's what I want to try and cut this morning. Look at verse 3. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? The Jewish community was a small community, although David was in Jerusalem, in a very ostentatious palace. They all knew each other. David's servants knew servants of uh, other VIPs, if you will. And of course, David's got his own secret police like the Catholic Church, have the Jesuits, and their job is to go out, and has been since the 16th century, to, if they need to, kill people, uh, turn people, betray people, set up honey traps, uh, but more importantly, what they normally do is try and undermine people's faith in the Bible. As I go through Schofield's reference Bible for the first time ever, normally, every few of, uh, uh, every three or four pages, Schofield is correct in the King James Bible, saying well, it should be this, it should be that. Of course, Schofield wasn't aware of the manuscript evidence, or maybe he was, and he chose to ignore it. Old nature, you see, is pride. You won't find many reference Bibles, if any, that present the King James Bible and don't even correct it. I think Hoffman and Ruttman would be the exceptions but all of my reference Bibles, and I've got a few, love, love to correct the new King, uh, the, the, new, the, uh, the King James Bible and offer the new King James in its place. David sent and inquired after the woman, who is she? And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, or Eliam, the wife, the wife, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, the Hittite, Gentile stock. And here you've got a man who is working for Israel, may have converted, and therefore he is a son of Israel, could be a proselyte. If you think of Simon the leper in the Gospels, when the Lord met him, no doubt he was healed, but he's still referred to as Simon the leper. That disease uh, remains part of his identity. Look at verse 4. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. So I'm going to suggest this, that he sees her, it's late at night, he summons one of his servants, it's late at night, says to one of his servants, who's that beautiful woman taking a bath? And yes, again, David is a type of a peeping Tom. Uh, Job would say that he wouldn't allow his eyes to look on maids. The Lord said, if you lusted after a woman, you'd already, you, you had already committed adultery with him in your heart. David was a red-blooded man, a typical heterosexual, had many women, many concubines, 
Now, one thing that I will say is when it, uh, when it comes to the Old Testament, there isn't one clear verse. People say, well, how about Deuteronomy 17? But there's no one clear verse where the Lord says, one man, one woman. Yes, the Lord gave uh, Eve to Adam. He married them, if you will. But Deuteronomy 17 says that the kings can't have gold and they can't have horses. Does that mean that the kings of Israel, or the king of Israel, is only allowed to have one gold cup, one horse, and one wife? Of course not. It's very difficult to find anywhere in Scripture where kings, leaders, were pro uh, prohibited from having wives in the plurality. I'm not saying the Lord is for it, but as we read through this, the Lord does allow David's, uh, David to have his way. Of course, the prophets, on the other hand, were either unmarried or married to just one woman. She came unto him, lay with her, but she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto a house. This has happened very quickly. I'm going to suggest this, that it's late at night. He knows who she is. His servants have identified her, and they go down to her house. Knock, knock, knock. The king is wanting to see you, has summoned you. She gets dressed, somewhat excited, somewhat apprehensive, goes with the servants to the palace. It's the first time she's ever been into the palace, the king's home. And he comes down to meet her, she sees him. It could be love at first sight, we don't know, but it happens very quickly. David, can I suggest, seduces her through his power. That's one of the reasons why these leaders around the world, not particularly handsome men, but powerful men, going right back to Henry VIII, have been able to enjoy female uh, admirers. Not because of their looks, although David was probably a handsome man, but because of their power, prestige, money. And she walked into the palace, somewhat stunned by this very grand, ostentatious home of the king. May have had a drink or two. Words are exchanged. And he lays with her, verse 4, as she returns unto her house. Happened very quickly. What well, started with David being unable to sleep, tossing and turning, mind is ticking, how are the men doing in the battle, or maybe he was thinking about other things, but either way he wasn't with his men, at least Cromwell, like I say, would be with his men. In fact, when Cromwell first began, he had almost no money to pay his men. His army was just 10 men, and uh, some of those men were his own family. And there are letters that I've read where Cromwell is writing back home, to friends and family saying, please send money. We are starving, we are freezing, we are baking, we have no money, we are suffering with trench warfare, like in a ditch, and uh, it's wet, and our feet are basically falling apart. Please send us money. And Cromwell's family would send him money to pay for his own army. Incredible, of course, by the end of his life, he's running the most successful army since the Roman Empire. Look at verse 5. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. So a few months have gone by, obviously, and David probably thought initially he could get away with this. He's got at least five or six women. Abigail would be one. Saul's daughter would be another. He was estranged from uh, Saul's Saul's daughter for a period of time but he's accumulate he's accumul accumulating women concubines and children <clears throat> it's like a dynasty basically all of the kings would do this and like i say apart from deuteronomy 17 which doesn't really clearly explicitly say that it's one man one woman until death all of the kings would would basically follow each other because the gentiles are doing it but go back before the law. You've got Jacob, four wives, and from four wives he gets 12 sons and a daughter. Woman conceived, verse 5, and sent and told David via one of his servants, it could be the same one that went to her, I am with child, I am pregnant, I am worried about it, my husband is out fighting like you should be David. And David's now got a dilemma. 
what is he going to do? Look at verse 6. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. So David isn't a fool. He may be carnal. He may be fleshly. He may be a backslider. Paul would say he was the chief of sinners. Romans chapter 7 is the greatest part in the entire Bible concerning the new man and the old man standing in state. David was certainly a saved man. And yet, if you read this piece of scripture and other parts of scripture, you wonder sometimes how he could do what he was doing. But you see, the pressure was so great until you find yourself in a situation like David where you start to panic and cover up uh, your behavior. You have really no idea of relating to this particular situation. David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah. Bring Uriah the Hittite and Joab sent Uriah to David. At this point, Joab has no idea what David is wanting to do. Why does he want to see Uriah? David would have had thousands of men serving at his pleasure. And all of a sudden he gets a cable, a telegram from the king. Uh, this is Joab, of course, from David saying, I want to see Uriah. Joab is no fool, but he doesn't know the whole story. Seven. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. He has no idea why David has summoned him, and David has no interest in knowing how Joab was doing, or how the people were getting on. This is a ploy. This is, a, this is, this is an excuse, basically. David is buying time, trying to find a way to keep Uriah in his palace and David said to Uriah go down to thy house and wash thy feet and Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a mess of meat from the king so the plan was quite simply this go back see your wife have relations with her and hopefully fingers crossed that that was David's thought hopefully fingers crossed she will conceive and uh, we will say that He's the father of my child. It's like reading about an unsaved man, isn't it? Go down to thy house, verse 8 again, and wash thy feet, relax yourself, calm yourself. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Take some food with you, enjoy your time, with your wife no rush back to the front line look at verse 9 but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord I went not down I went not down to his house so where David is verse 1 Uriah does well does the right thing David was in error, uh, verse 1, whereas Uriah was in the right, verse 9. Slept at the door of the king's house with all the, uh, with all the servants of his lord. He's sleeping with David's men, like in a dormitory. I went not down to his house. David is now panicking. What's going on? How many men would refuse to spend time with their wives he's been fighting for at least three months may i suggest he's covered in filth he's been fighting close hand combat david has given him food hoping and praying that he would go back home see his wife and nature would take its course this is all coming from the mind of king david a saved jew type of the Messiah but David like all of us has two natures old man son of Adam new man son of David look at verse 10 and when they had told David saying Uriah went not down unto his house David said unto Uriah comest thou not from thy journey why then didst thou not go down unto thine house why are you staying here Uriah you're on leave. 
I've given you leave, I've given you food, your wife is waiting for you, but you see Uriah is a decent man, possibly a Jewish proselyte, a Hittite from birth, became a soldier in David's army, possibly converted over to Judaism, like I say, and yet David doesn't really understand what is going on, because most men would go straight back to their homes and enjoy relations with their wife. Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? Why are you still here, Uriah? I need you, and he's saying this under his breath, <coughs> to go and see your wife, so we can say you are the father of a soon-to-be child. Look at verse 11. And Uriah said unto David, The ark, the ark, it's the first thing that comes into his mind, the ark. This guy's a Gentile by birth, but I believe a proselyte through choice. The ark and Israel and Judah. This is priority. Ark, Israel, Judah, abide in tents. They're out in an area like this, fighting, hand-to-hand -hand combat, like I say. And my lord, Joab, they're all together, your majesty. And the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. It's freezing cold. I should be with my men, but on your orders, your majesty, I am in your presence enjoying your company i don't really know why i am here i am itching to get back to the front line shall i then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as thou livest and as thy soul liveth i will not do this thing once again remarkable <coughs> he could have gone back to his house for some time with his wife he could have had a change of clothes it says how he had children and it's my belief that uriah was older than bathsheba she was probably a young bride when he married her and he had children from his first marriage i would imagine but no he won't do it as thou livest your majesty and as thy soul liveth i will not do this thing here's a man which won't be shaken Here's a man which has resolve. Here's a man who has principles, morals. Most people today don't have morals or principles. They may say they do, but the reality is they do not. Because again, every man in his best state is altogether vanity. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why callest thou me good? There isn't any good but God. But what this man is saying to David is what David should be saying to him if the tables were turned. David should be saying to Uriah, I'm the king of Israel, I should be out with my men, I shouldn't be uh, staying at home, walking around on my roof, observing women like a peeping tom. I should be, I should be with Joab and my men. But like I say, David is lazy. He's backslidden. And what do they say? The devil makes work for idle hands. 12. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also and tomorrow. I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. He's buying time. He's hoping that Uriah will change his mind. Go back to his wife. Enjoy time with her. If you think of the popes over the past thousand years or so most had either female lovers male lovers some were sodomites some were pedophiles some were predators in general and that's one of the reasons why martin luther was devastated when he went to rome for the first time i mean talk about naive and he got to rome and as he was walking around the crowded streets he passed brothel after brothel after brothel he saw idols being sold all over the place, indulgences, they call them, and the Church of Rome still push indulgences. It may have been 25 years ago, Patrick was invited to a walk, basically, in our town, 
uh, from one church to another and the point of the walk was to receive an indulgence time off from purgatory it's laughable now isn't it but at the time Patrick didn't know any better didn't know the Bible and he marched with about 300 Catholics with the priest leading from the front from one church to another and the priest said to the uh, parishioners well done you've all knocked off 300 years in purgatory but when Luther arrived in Rome uh, 16th century he was shocked bishops cardinals with whores in brothels and he thought to himself what's going on here these are princes of the church had Martin Luther read the Old Testament had he really studied David and uh, Abraham and other great Old Testament men he would have known what mankind is capable of doing but Luther was locked away in a monastery he was cut off from the world basically and he was shocked to see such debauchery whereas David is a man and David is a man's man tarry here today also and tomorrow I will let thee depart so Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow you can't fault him can you Uriah was a perfect man not sinless but impeccable when it comes to this incident twice has been offered leave twice has been encouraged almost pushed out of the king's palace to go back home to his wife and enjoy time with her he says no i'm going to stay with you because again joab is fighting the men are fighting the ark and israel and judah abide in tents verse 11 i can't imagine it your majesty going to see my wife in some ways this is the sort of man that Christian men should be looking to emulate a Gentile by birth but a proselyte by choice thirteen and when David had called him he did eat and drink before him and he made him drunk and he made him drunk David made him drunk and at even evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his lord but went not down to his house three times David attempts to get Uriah to do his bidding for him basically three times David seeks to trick Uriah three times Simon Peter denies the Messiah and here David again is behaving like an unsaved man but he was saved he was as saved as anybody could be saved but he has free will you see and free will can allow you to do this or that yield to the Holy Ghost being the new man or yield to the old nature being Adam's nature of course and when David called him he did eat and drink before him a final meal if you will one last attempt by David to deceive Uriah to do what David wants him to do and he made him drunk so it's bad enough he's been recalled from the front line I'm sure his men missed him I'm sure Uriah was a good faithful soldier a great fighter he's been withdrawn from the front line if that wasn't bad enough he's been detained at the king's pleasure what do they say today when somebody goes to prison he or she is being detained at her majesty's pleasure and here Uriah is being detained at the king's pleasure and after two or three attempts in fact this will be the third attempt after two attempts to get him to go back to Bathsheba and with these failing David decides to get him drunk and he made him drunk and at even evening he went out to lie in his bed with the servants of his lord but 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 went not down to his house remarkable remarkable how many men do you think could turn down the offer of going back home to see their wives after many months fighting there was nothing to suggest that Bathsheba 
and Uriah weren't close. But he has a love for the ark, Israel, Judah, and also David, and ultimately the Lord. Remarkable. And it puts many saved men to shame. 14. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. David continues to spiral out of control. Too much time on his hands. And again, if you don't, if you don't spend your time wisely, things like this can uh, take place. But like I said at the beginning of this message, I could call this video the letter. Because now David is going to seal the man's fate in a letter. I can think of two letters that were written over the last few hundred years uh, that come to my mind from the open air pulpit this morning. I can think of King James writing a letter to his son Charles when he was in Spain seeking out a Catholic bride and there were times when King James also played a very dangerous game he would play uh, Spain off Elizabeth and Elizabeth off Spain and he would say to Elizabeth if you don't help me out I would do a deal with Catholic Spain and he would say to Catholic Spain if you don't help me out I would do a deal with Elizabeth this is before he became King of England of course but once he became King of England Scotland, Ireland, and also France, not to mention Wales at that time. In fact, he came up with the term Great Britain. And you look at Scotland today, led by a left-wing, socialist, pro-Brussels party, the SNP, they have forgotten their roots. Scotland's most famous king was a passionate believer, uh, believer in the Union. Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, no divisions then of course, and also France and Wales. He believed in the Union, but especially the four nations, England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. But today, the government in Scotland, a minority government, I might, I might add, are more keen to embrace Brussels than Britain. A foreign entity, a foreign language and even a foreign currency. It wouldn't be long ago that such people would be called traitors. So one letter would consist of King David writing to Charles when he was in Spain. Come back to England, he would say. Uh, Daddy misses you. That's the sort of language that James would use. And he's been accused over the years of being effeminate. Not particularly. It was just the way that he was. It's how he was raised. It was his... It was his uh, demeanor basically always remember this that king james had no mother she was in prison father was murdered would be raised by regents and uh au pairs i suppose we would say today never really loved although i have one account of a guy called george buchanan physically disciplining uh, king james and one of his aides one of his nannies came into the room and said, how dare you touch the Lord's anointed? Going back to David and Saul. And she screamed at George Buchanan. And I've been to Glasgow and there are many parts of Glasgow to this day named after him. And old George Buchanan had to back pedal, basically, get out of the room. Another letter that comes to my mind would be 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And at that time, the Russians decided to send warships from Russia to Cuba. And they had the great idea of putting nuclear warheads on Cuba, in Cuba. And uh, I think for memory, the distance from Cuba to Florida is around 25, 30 miles. A bit like Dover is to Calais in France. And uh, the Americans weren't happy about this, as you would imagine. They saw this as very provocative, and of course it was. Although, go back to the 1960s, you got American weapons, American troops, uh, NATO basically, all over Europe, all over uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Russians felt penned in. 
during that time, so they decided to retaliate. And they sent ships and uh, nuclear weapons to Cuba, a communist country. And all of these socialists today that we hear about, read about, whether in America or in Britain, it could be uh, Corbyn in this country or Saunders or Sanders, Bernie Sanders in America. They all look up to socialists like the Russians. And of course, those people that they look up to, going back to Lenin, right through to, uh, right through to probably Gorbachev, were killers. And yet today, the left wing seem to fall over themselves to salute such people. I saw an interview just a few days ago with Gorbachev. He's about 90 now. And the journalist sat down with Gorbachev and was very deferential, like he was speaking to a great statesman. Gorbachev saw the death directly and indirectly of thousands. He's a war criminal, but because he's on the left, he's been able to avoid scrutiny from the uh, courts. And I think of the court in The Hague, especially. But back in 62, uh, you had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it caused a lot of alarm. People around the world were thinking this could be the end of the world. Of course, those that believe in the Bible knew that the rapture had to come first. And after the rapture, the Lord would return at the end of the Great Tribulation. Yes, there was a reference in Zechariah how nuclear weapons may be used during the Tribulation, but that takes place after the church has been removed. And those weapons don't destroy everyone and everything. Because if that were the case, where would Christ reign upon his return? But during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you've got two brothers running the White House. And it's quite clever, really, what they did. Basically, the Russians uh, were told to pull out of Cuba and take their weapons back to Russia. And the Russians initially sat on their hands. What do we do? The Americans say this is an act of war if we don't remove our weapons, which technically was a bit of an overstatement, but you can understand the Americans' apprehension. Nuclear, we uh, nuclear weapons off the coast of America, no more than 30 miles away, and yet, again, the Americans had over one and a half million soldiers all over Europe, right up until the end of the Cold War. Nuclear warheads pointing at different parts of Russia, and yet even today, Russia, Russia has more nuclear weapons than America, and other countries combined, and yet the pressure continues to be on the West to de-arm. And I think if Corbyn, God forbid, were to become Prime Minister, he would probably seek to destroy Britain's nuclear weapons. But letters are going back and forth between uh, Moscow and Washington, and two letters were written from the Russians to the Americans. At the time, it was Khrushchev writing to Kennedy. And the first letter was pretty stern, like, we won't withdraw our weapons if you don't withdraw your weapons from Eastern Europe. And the second letter was more conciliatory. And for 11 days, the world held its breath. And Robert Kennedy said to his brother, Jack Kennedy, let's respond to the second letter. Let's ignore the first letter. Something as simple as that. And the second letter, like I say, was more conciliatory compared to the first. And the president signed a letter saying, uh, please remove uh, your ships and your nuclear weapons. And we will consider doing something similar in uh, Western and Eastern Europe. I forget the exact tone of Kennedy's letter, but it worked. The Russians got a letter in response to their second letter, not the first letter. And of course, the rest is history. Came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Poor old Uriah. Three times David has sought to seduce him, to deceive him. When that fails, and even after intoxicating, 
Uriah, he's now carrying a letter which is his death warrant. Not many infamous letters like this that come to my mind from the open-air pulpit this morning. Most of the letters I can think of from leaders in some ways are quite uh, mundane. Although the Cuban Missile Crisis back in 62 wasn't mundane and those that didn't know their Bibles were panicking. We're going to die, we're going to die. Russia will launch, America will launch, we'll all be wiped out in minutes. And around that time, in 1962, Britain had 80 RAF bombers with nuclear weapons on the tarmacs, tarmacs, ready to go. I think it was Macmillan back in 62. The world came very near. But here's the thing about that incident. Those that know history know that the Russians always back down. Go back to 1949, the Berlin airlift you've got millions of starving germans freezing cold it's winter time and the allies are aware that the germans are dying they're starving basically and the russians like the chinese today are marxists darwinists atheists basically survival of the fittest as darwin would say and the allies 49 that would be uh atley and uh truman decided to uh, drop food parcels, crates of food on starving uh, Germans. And people said, oh, that'll be an act of war. Stalin will retaliate and there'll be third world war. There'll be a major war. And the Allies said, no, we'll take a chance. We feel we have to do something. If we don't do something, they're going to die, basically. The West has always been compassionate. They may be sinful, but when it comes to an emergency they are always compassionate look at israel when there's when there's been earthquakes around the world israel is at the vanguard she sends her sniffer dogs her emergency personnel and they arrive on the scene and within moments of arriving they do a, a tremendous work but nothing came of it food was dropped many many germans survived the bitterly cold winter and that was the first time that Russia backed down. 62, Russia backed down, pulled the missiles out of Cuba. And that clever idea from Robert Kennedy responds to the second letter. Not the first letter made all the difference in the world. Two years ago, a Turkish fighter jet shot down a Russian fighter jet in uh, Syria. And people were saying, watch out, this is going to be serious. Turkey is in NATO, Russia is going to, uh, Russia is going to uh, retaliate, retaliate, and of course if they hit Turkey, NATO will get involved, major conflict. I thought, no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Putin phones up Erdogan, a couple of tyrants, two dictators, cut from the same cloth, best of friends, nothing happens. But people don't know their history. People don't know their Bibles. And this is why so many people suffer with anxiety. Look at verse 15. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest of battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. Sacrifice him, Joab. Kill him, Joab. Put him into a situation where he cannot survive, outnumbered, by maybe a hundred to one and then pull back so there's no possibility of a rescue party being sent in to rescue him now again we read the bible and we read about stories such as this and we don't agree with david's behavior but we never said that the old testament greats were sinless this book doesn't present sinless people it presents sinful people who need a savior People like me, people like you, people like us. We're not deceived. We don't worship people in the Bible. We only worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Set Uriah, put Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle where it's really kicking off and retire ye from him. Get away from him that he may be smitten 
and die. This is a death warrant, basically. It starts off with a death letter, becomes a death warrant. David has signed his death certificate, basically. David is judge, jury, executioner. Good godly man, loved the Lord, worshipped the Lord, never committed the sin of idolatry, but here he's behaving like a cold-blooded killer. And he's saved. You can't understand it, can you? O wretched man that I am, that which I want to do, I do not do, and what I don't want to do, I do. Sixteen, and it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. Joab is complicit in this act of murder. Let's call it what it is. It's murder. David is plotting, premeditating Uriah's death. His chief of staff is now part of the plot. Anything to please the king. Joab observed the city and he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. I guess it's like sending a normal British soldier, perhaps a private or a corporal, or well, let's give it, let's, let's uh, upgrade him. Let's say you put a captain, a normal British captain, into a battle and he's fighting maybe 50 men. There's no chance he could he could win against 50 men. However, if you put a Royal Marine or a paratrooper or a commando into such a battle, perhaps, perhaps he could hold off. He may not be able to beat 50 men, but he could certainly put up a real fight. But Uriah, as good as he was, isn't going to be able, isn't going to, be able to overcome this hottest battle and survive. Valiant men, hottest battle, sent a letter via Joab. This is so sad and yet probably quite typical. It's not just God's people who do things like this. There have been many people over the years when push has come to shove have just jumped ship, just jumped ship basically. Skin for skin, all that a man has will he give. That, that goes back to the account with uh, Job and the devil. Let me, get at it. Let me get at him, Lord. He doesn't worship you for nothing. Let me really put the pressure on him and he will curse you to your face. An old Job is put through the mill, doesn't buckle once, tells his wife to be quiet. Another remarkable man. But of course, Job's problem was he was self-righteous. 17. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also. So it's bad enough to trick Uriah, intoxicate him, send him back to the front line to die, to be sacrificed to the Philistines. And of course the Philistines worshipped Dagon. I mean this shows you how quickly a saved man can fall from grace. Not in reference to losing his salvation, but falling very quickly out of fellowship with the Lord. And here Uriah has been sacrificed to the Philistines, and that wasn't bad enough. So too have some of the people, verse 17, a group of people. Like I said at the beginning of this message, there's more to the story than just David eyeing up Bathsheba, sending for her, taking her to be his lover. It's more than that, it's the premeditation, premeditated plotting and planning to murder her husband. But on top of that, and some of the people. So David, a saved Jew, has sacrificed faithful sons of Israel along with a proselyte from the Hittites. I'm going to suggest at least two or three dozen people have been murdered on David's orders. One more time, verse 17. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David. 
sons of Israel, and Uriah the Hittite died also. So David has finally accomplished his plan. He will say, well, Bathsheba is now with child, her husband is dead, and slowly but surely, people will forget about Uriah, and uh, his wife, Bathsheba, will be able to move on, a bit like when uh, Nabal died, and David then took Abigail for his wife, but every time she appears in scripture, one more time, she's called Abigail, comma, the wife of Nabal, and here, Bathsheba, comma, the wife of Uriah 18 then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger saying when thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king and if so be that the king's wrath ar ar arise and he say unto thee wherefore approachest wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when he did fight, know you not that they would shoot from the wall, as if David didn't know what was going on. It's like a game. David knew what was going on. David was a fighter. He was a general. Should have been out with his men. He knows how wars go. He knows how battles are fought. And here Joab is basically not just battering up the king, trying to be a man pleaser. And Paul told you in Galatians 1 that he wasn't interested in uh, pleasing men but pleasing the Lord the Jews wouldn't believe on Jesus for uh, their own selves obviously but they wouldn't uh, believe on Jesus because they wanted the praise of men more than the praise of God look at 22 so the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for your majesty I have news for you Uriah is dead, some of your men are dead. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us, and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. This man doesn't know what's going on. He's not privy to this plot. And he thinks the king will be angry because they've lost this particular battle. 24. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants and some of the king's servants be dead and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also Uriah the Hittite is dead also he may have been quite well known in uh, Jewish circles or circles in Jerusalem either way he has gone down in scripture he's gone down in history as a remarkable man I'm sure when he was born and was raised amongst the Hittites never once in a million years thought he would find his name in the book of all books, the Holy Bible. I never once think that people would be speaking about him thousands of years later. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. Some of your men are dead, I'm going to suggest three dozen. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. It doesn't get more sad than a story such as this. I mean, David is commended time after time in the Bible for wanting to build a house for the Lord, worshipping the Lord, seeing Israel through some dark and difficult days, and yet his flesh, our flesh, got him down gets us down and here David is probably clapping his hands jumping up and down internally of course 25 then David said unto the messenger thus shalt thou say unto Joab let not this thing displease thee for the sword devoureth one as well as another in other words in other words this is what happens when wars are uh, being fought people die and that's true soldiers know that when they go overseas to fight they will fight and sometimes die that is very true but this man Uriah was sacrificed by his own side his own side killed him to cover up David's sin and it's possible that Joab knew about David's 
liaison with Bathsheba. I think it's probably fair to say that David's servants or Joab's spies knew what was going on. It was a small community and Joab probably had a mistress or two tucked away and thought, well, if our king can have women left, right and centre, so too can I. I am the captain of the king's army and therefore I would do his bidding for him. But this is a shameful incident. It's one thing to have a relationship with Bathsheba, but to go beyond that. And that's why I think David got into such trouble over the whole situation, because an innocent man was sacrificed. And on top of that, so too were some of his own people. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and, uh, and encourage thou him. In other words, well, we've lost some men. We accept that, Joab. You and I are fighting partners. We fought many battles together, and we will fight many more in the future. What do they call this? Collateral damage, basically. Collateral damage. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. I think she loved him. I think she loved him. I think he loved her. I think they were an ordinary, typical couple back in the Old Testament. But when she met the king, when she met Israel's prince, he seduced her with his tongue. He was probably very uh, careful with his words. What do they say? Women fall in love with what they hear, whereas men fall in love with what they see. And David was a poet, don't forget. David was a musician, don't forget. And Solomon was also a poet. Nice long love letters, nice long songs, or nice songs, words of poetry. She knew who David was. It says how David kills his thousands upon thousands, whereas Saul, in fact, it says how David killed his tens of thousands, whereas Saul only killed his thousands. David was known all over Israel and the Gentile world. She's probably. Uh, humbled, shocked, probably uh, shocked that he would even be looking at her. And when the wife of Uriah, she's always called that, and when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she didn't know how he had died. David didn't tell her how he had died. I'm not even sure she knew later on exactly what happened until Gad. In fact, it was Nathan who would confront David and make this public. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. So again, I think she loved him, but she was seduced, basically, by a man who had everything and owned everyone. Wealthy, powerful, prosperous, popular, and she couldn't resist his charms, basically. And that's one of the uh, aspects of the uh, Antichrist. He uses flattery to get what he wants. And David's smooth talking got him a Bathsheba. A child was conceived due to their relationship. But now, as a result of pregnant Bathsheba, her husband has been murdered, basically. David has murdered him, along with Joab, at this time again. I don't think she knows. In fact, I'm pretty sure she doesn't know that David has arranged the assassination of her husband. But he has, and on top of that, he's allowed the Gentiles to do it. And turn around and say to the Jews, well, we fought a good battle, but those unclean, uncircumcised Gentiles have been able to uh, win this battle, and he probably used such a sad story or a sad event concerning the death of Uriah to whip up more support. Come on you Jews, rise up, let's fight the Gentiles. That's what Stalin would do back in World War II. For many years he put priests in prison, persecuted Christians, murdered many Christians, and yet Corbyn thinks the world of Stalin. So too does Bernie Sanders, another left-wing socialist around the world, and yet those countries like Russia and China and North Korea uh, wouldn't allow these wealthy Westerners 
to survive five minutes in those countries. In fact, people like Saunders or Sanders, I think it's Sanders actually, Sanders and Corbyn, they, they are millionaires. I heard of one figure how Jeremy Corbyn is worth four million pounds. Four million pounds. Far more than uh, Boris Johnson, who's worth about two million pounds. No, make that a million pounds actually. But the point is this. Stalin was able to use uh, the threat of a, of a uh, German invasion into Russia, which was a reality. And he turned around and said to his people, we need to unite behind Holy Mother Russia. And Stalin got 10, 15, almost 20 million men mobilized to push back the Germans. It worked. And I think David would be very pleased with himself to use the death of Uriah to get the Jews all on board to retaliate, basically. 27. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I don't know what David's plan was. He's just publicly overseen the burial of Uriah. I'm sure that was quite a show he put on. I'm sure many of Israel's senior uh, politicians, leaders came together to remember Uriah, a remarkable man. Also the men that died alongside him, uh, which are sometimes overlooked. Verse 17. But here Bathsheba is pregnant two three months pregnant at least she knows she is pregnant and David takes her to be his wife I suppose some ceremony has taken place we're not told exactly what that would be she's now officially his wife how he thought he could get away with this I don't really know I mean she's three months pregnant he marries her and then what seven months later she gives birth to their child how would he explain the three month discrepancy or does he marry her and say to Israel, well, she's going to give birth to Uriah's son. And I'm such a wonderful king. I'm going to adopt Uriah's son as my own son. It's not overly clear what David planned to do. But it says how this thing displeased, displeased the Lord. So the entire Bathsheba event from verse 1 to verse 27 was pitiful, could have been avoided. Had David been fighting with his men, he wouldn't have seen Bathsheba on that particular evening. That's not to say he wouldn't have seen her on another occasion, but on that particular occasion he saw her, liked what he saw, sent for her. She was summoned to his palace, fell in love with what she saw, not just who she saw, but what she saw. King, palace, power, prestige. They get together like the same night she conceives she knows she is pregnant she tells david he starts to panic he may be powerful he may be the lord's anointed but he doesn't want a scandal getting out he tries to cover it up but he makes things worse because not only would uriah die which he was prepared to do but so too would some of israel's finest sons that results in uh, Bathsheba mourning but that's not a big issue for David because he knows eventually she will pass the points of uh, grieving mourning and he will take her to be his wife get together and live happily ever after and of course chapter 12 which I may look at on another occasion is really the uh, the repercussion of David's behavior so this a video from a very glorious sunny open air pulpit looks at the life of King David a saved man but a carnal man a fleshly man you reap what you sow the boy will be born to uh, David and uh, Bathsheba but the baby would die basically the Lord said I'm gonna kill the baby I will spare you David I will spare Bathsheba and the more you read the Old Testament, the more you have to really think about, on the one hand, how the law works, and on the other hand, how the Lord 
uses the law and grace to fulfill his own good pleasure. For example, David takes his first wife back to him, Saul's daughter, but when he takes her back to him, she's already married somebody. But Deuteronomy 24 says you can't take back a divorced woman. You can't take back your wife once she's divorced you and remarried. David would survive physically this incident, so too with Bathsheba, and yet adultery in the Old Testament couldn't be pardoned. No animal sacrifice could cover adultery or murder. And David was a murderer and an adulterer. The Lord suspends the law, basically. He is the sovereign. He's able to do that. He's able to give pardons. And with those of us which are saved, he's given us a pardon. He's pardoned us, praise the Lord. He has suspended the law and he has saved us. But David is a very complex man. And yes, I say that a lot from the open air pulpits and elsewhere, but it's true. Very complex, love the Lord, loved Israel, loved the ark. I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to write a good part to the Old Testament. I will never have false gods, and David never did, unlike Solomon. But his weakness would be women. Women, left, right and centre. Children, left, right and centre. And I think what really tarnished David's reputation was how he killed, made that murdered, premeditated the murder of Uriah and faithful sons of Israel. So David could fall from grace. Others could fall from grace, and if they could fall from grace, you could fall from grace. I could fall from grace. We could all, we could all, we could all fall from grace. And that's why it's so important to stay in the scripture. Be careful what you see. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful how you behave yourself when you are not doing what you should be doing. And even when you are doing what you should be doing, there's always the potential of the world, the flesh and the devil to mess you up and destroy you. But maybe next time or down the line, I will return and continue looking at David uh, from chapter 12, especially, and possibly chapter 13. David's kingdom was never the same after this, incidentally. Uh, yes, you reap what you sow. David's kingdom was divided. The sword would never leave his kingdom. He may have survived physically, and he did. Bathsheba survived physically, and she did. They would remain together, also, interestingly, have a child called Solomon, or Jediah, greatly beloved of the Lord. And again, it shows the complexity of the law and grace, how the Lord deals with his own people. At best, we could say David and his behaviour is a picture of what God can and will do to people living today who also stray into similar situations. Severe chastisement and possibly, if the Lord decrees it, physical death. But don't play with sin. What David did was pretty despicable. It was pretty horrendous. An innocent man died. Israel lost a battle basically and it says elsewhere how the gentiles were able to blaspheme god almighty due to david's behavior so i'll close it there on that somber statement but i wanted to make this video because the more i read the old testament and i'm hoping to finish second samuel tonight the more i see how god's people are portrayed in scripture and that's why i don't find it too shocking anymore when I read uh, through church history, uh, books about church history, or I look at church history, or I hear about people, or I know about people who go south, basically, or get into situations, I think, well, God's people in the book got into worse situations than most of what we hear about today, or throughout church history, and were still saved. They were still saved. Uh, that doesn't mean it's right to do it. I don't want to justify people's behaviour. If it's like that, obviously not. But I understand why people do what they do. Too much time on their hands, too much power, too much money, too much privilege. It can corrupt you. Uh, going back to the famous book, Animal Farm, 
power crops, uh, crops, absolutely. I think that's the expression anyway, but absolute power crops, crops, absolutely, or power crops, absolutely. I'll be correct on that probably, but it's true. Absolute power crops, and it really does. And uh, because David was saved, he was able to recover from this uh, incident, but he was never the same again. He was weakened physically, spiritually, geographically, and uh, he would have to live with his guilt dealing with the murder of Uriah and other sons of Israel. That's what I think really displeased the Lord. It wasn't just Bathsheba, it wasn't just Abigail, also referred to, like I say, as the wife of Nabal, but it was the cover-up, the complicity. It was getting people involved to cover up David's sins and people being happy, like Joab, to cover up his master's sins, which just goes to show that once a leader falls, once a leader goes south, once a leader starts to decline, his entire nation goes with him. And that was very true during the time of David, back in 2 Samuel. And I will leave it there from this beautiful open air pulpit and uh, wish you every blessing, peace and joy in the wonderful name of our God and Saviour the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen.